Hey everybody, welcome to another live stream episode. Uh, this is the great Johannes speaking, Johannes Mattis Conrad. I do usual uh, live streams nowadays, once a day or so, and I will discuss a whole range of topics. And uh, today I'm going to talk about um, the things people don't think about when they see certain changes take place in our societies. Uh, for example, uh, in education or in demographics or so, or in uh, literacy levels among the general population, uh, there are all sorts of reasons and excuses people try to make up to explain these things. Like, why are, for example, Dutch kids uh, increasingly less literate than previous generations? Why are British uh, uh, children, British boys, nowadays sh on average shorter than they used to be in the past? And how come people who arrive at higher education at university, for example, are all of a sudden uh, uh, less educated than, than previous generations? And <laughs> yeah, someone comments it must be bad nutrition. I'm going to go over a couple of examples because it's a bit more than bad nutrition. What happens when you replace a population with immigrants? The population changes. It doesn't stay the same. It's not like because we have democratic institutions, therefore everybody coming to the West will want to become democratic. Uh, duh. So uh, let me give you a great example. I'll, let's see if I can put it on screen on my, uh, put my browser on screen. Uh, someone asks, what do I know about the third eye? More than I'm allowed to tell you. <laughs> um, that's maybe a topic for another uh, for another issue. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to start wearing wearing the hat nowadays because uh, you know I want to make myself a bit more recognizable. Since I'm not as pretty as uh, as a movie star, I have to have something else to stand out, right? So uh, this is on screen is something in Dodge. Um, this is crazy. Uh, literacy is running backwards again. A third of pupils in the Netherlands. Uh, can't read read well enough to take part in society. One in three pupils going to school in the Netherlands today can't read well enough to participate in society. And then he says we need more teachers, I mean, we need more blah blah, more knowledge, education and blah blah. And we need to review the Dutch, uh, the Dutch language course in education. Hmm, this should be priority number one. Yeah, of course. This is what happens when you bring migrants to your country. He doesn't mention it, and that's very strange. Why don't you immediately mention, oh, this is because of immigration. We have 50% of kids in the west of the Netherlands nowadays have an immigration background. 50% of kids under age 10 or so are not Dutch anymore. Their parents don't speak Dutch, or their grandparents didn't speak Dutch when they arrived. And so you have a whole generation, second, third, fourth, fifth generations even, who are not able to speak Dutch well enough to participate in society. And this is so strange that whenever we have these kinds of issues, we are, uh, you know, we, we don't want to talk about the demographic changes. And so they try to patch everything up. Oh, let's uh, focus on new teaching methods or something. No, of course, you see, in the past, the, the, the course Dutch in the Netherlands used to be a literature course. They would teach you about the Dutch writers. They would teach you also about grammar and so on. They would teach you about uh, the difference between the difference between literature and lecture, right? Uh, between poetry and uh, uh, and prose. Nowadays, they have to teach kids to speak Dutch, or they won't be able to participate in all the other courses that they want to teach them. How are you going to indoctrinate children in the scientific worldview? If they can't speak the language, you're trying to indoctrinate them in. <laughs> you know, this is really peculiar that all our, our, our what, what, would we, what would you call them? Our pro-socialist democratic politicians, uh, <laughs> sand and KFC people, uh, our politicians don't, don't want to don't get with the program. They don't want to understand what's really going on there. They can't mention it. Because if they had to mention it, that you know immigration is going to lead to the death of our society, and that the people you you brought into the Netherlands to wipe old white people's asses when they retire, right, when they need care, won't really be able to do so, because they won't be able to understand the language. Yeah, sand and KFC people will never integrate into Western societies. No, because there's a ton more differences, and I'll go over some more. Uh, if you can see it on screen now, 
uh, I believe this is someone from, someone from Ireland uh, posted a, a graph that the average height of five-year-old boys in, I, I assume this is in Britain, by the way, dropped. Oh, here you can see. Oh, watch. It's Germany in the green line up top, right? And then you have the United States, France, and United Kingdom. Now, this is odd. How come in the United States and in the United Kingdom in the past few years, the average height of five-year-old boys significantly dropped? Yeah? How come? Could it be that a certain Latin demographic moved to the USA and a certain Indian demographic moved to the UK and these people are short? Now, what's really funny about this guy is he goes into it a little bit. Uh, there's this article uh, here. Let me click on the article. So there's this article where they go into this issue, like why are kids uh, kids in the, in the UK and, uh, and in the USA get, getting shorter and shorter? And they go into about, well, it must be diet. It must be poverty. There, there's like they're making it a story about there's not enough equality. When obviously in reality, you're dealing with new demographics. This is an ethnically racially different demographic that is uh, genetically shorter. Genes play a role. Genes play a role, but they don't want to know about that. Yeah. So let me go back to this uh, graph over here. Genetics plays a role. You're replacing the native population with an entirely new population, right? And then you're surprised that they can't read. <laughs> they can't, uh, they're not as tall. And this is funny. It means that in some in places like the US and the United Kingdom, by the way, white people, white men today are still the tallest men on average in the world. Uh, there are some exceptions like in South Sudan, you have some tall people, but then again, the Frisians and the Netherlands are even taller than the South Sudanese. So, so on average, the white men are still considerably taller and bigger, physically bigger, heavier as well than, uh, than all other men in the world. Uh, and that means even in the UK, where white people are not that tall in the UK anyway, but they will still end up being taller on average than the newcomers, than many of the migrants, meaning the shorter, the, the genetically shorter brown fellows will literally be lorded over by the taller white people. You know, and so it will go in the USA. You can, you can bring in all the people you want, but if you disregard the fact that they are actually genetically different, then perhaps uh, unexpected consequences might happen, you know? Wait a minute. So... Someone asks me, like, what political ideology suits me the most? Probably something reactionary where we reinstate in, uh, an aristocracy, in Europe at least. And this aristocracy's job it is to lead Europe to a new sort of mighty age where we revive the European spirit, the strength. Because we have so many old people in Europe, we have the old boomer generations here, right? They are going to die out anyway. But then what are you going to do? You're going to replace your people with Muslims, Arabs, Africans, and so on, or Indians and Chinese? Or are you actually going to turn Europe into a sort of Spartan warrior state? So I would say reactionary conservatism or something like that, or basically the reaction. If you don't want to make it an ism, everything's always an ism, right? Nationalism, conservativeism, socialism. Why don't we call what we want to do the reaction? No ism. We're going to beat back all the isms in a sense, right? But let me go on a little bit. I was talking about how demographic changes are not being picked up by the smart intellectual people. Here's a really interesting uh, take. Yeah. This guy writes about a friend of his who is teaching at a highly regarded liberal arts college in the USA, I presume. Uh, and he told me about uh, the first day of class. To counter the notion that God is an idea in the head because you can't see him, he wanted to refer to other things you, you know about but can't really see or can't really or can only see slightly or can experience only distantly or only by a series of intermediaries. So he mentions the Milky Way, but the students in this liberal liberal arts class said none of the students could identify the Milky Way. I hope my listeners know what the Milky Way is. You know, it's our galaxy. Right? But, but they call it the Milky Way. Um, you can see it at night. I saw it several times at night. If you move out of the cities into the countryside, away from lights, or away from city lights, you will be able to see with the naked eye the Milky Way. 
I remember the first time I saw it, I was on the south side of Crete Island of Greece, right? On the south side, it's not so touristy, not many people there. And I, I went on a little hike at night. Around midnight, I arrived at some kind of beach, walked on the beach, and then I looked up to the sky and I saw the Milky Way. And I was surprised at the fact that how big it was, because when you look at the Milky Way in, in, uh, in the horizontal view, basically, uh, it fills your entire field of vision from left to right, from the left corner of your eye to the right corner of your right eye. You see the whole Milky Way has a bit of a pinkish purple, purple tone. You see the stars. It's just so it's just so beautiful to look at it. You know, it kind of suggests that we with planet Earth are living on the outskirts of our galaxy. And so we can see it from afar. Therefore. Anyway, this teacher from the Liberal Arts College then mentions the planet Jupiter. Turns out the students also didn't know what Jupiter was. He says that the students generally, the liberal, liberal arts students, have the intellectual level of 10-year-olds. And so he was stunned uh, at the colossal failure of our schools. And then this other guy writes a comment about this, so blah, 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 blah. He tries to figure out why is it so that um, people who go to college nowadays Is it working? All right. Okay, very strange. Doesn't matter. So I'm talking about the fact that some students at the liberal arts college couldn't uh, understand what the Milky Way was or what uh, Jupiter was. And then the argument is, well, well, it's got to be the internet. Oh, cell phones. We thought cell phones were going to make people smarter. And we didn't know um, that cell phones actually make people dumb. But of course, it has nothing to do with cell phones. It has something to do with changing demographics. If you look at the students who go to a liberal arts college in the USA today, it's basketball players, right? It's the wrong people. You know, you'd expect like... 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it would have been mostly white people going there and they knew what the Milky Way was, they knew what Jupiter was. And now you have a whole different demographic who traditionally never think about these concepts because they're very abstract. They don't do abstract thinking. Basketball players think about what's right in front of them, not about, you know, what's up there, what they can't see. The whole notion, by the way, of being able to grasp seeing things that aren't there, such as abstract concepts. Say, I'm thinking about the Milky Way right now. I can't see it, but I can think about it. I can imagine it. People with low IQs have trouble imagining these things. It's the reason why people with an IQ below 75 will have trouble using microwaves, for example. And that's because when you use a microwave, you have to imagine what the device is going to do to your food. And people with too low IQs cannot imagine the result and if you can't imagine the result then you can't operate a microwave so it's all about imagination and certain people you know newcomers to our societies have trouble imagining the big concepts that we take for granted in the west such as uh knowing that the sun is a star and that the earth is a planet or the milky way and so on and so forth so basically that's what i wanted to talk about and uh, i noticed that my internet connection dropped out several times now so maybe I'll continue talking in general about uh, replacement immigration. It is definitely not a good idea. Not if you care about your society, not if you care about your people. This notion that you can bring people to Europe, to any country in Europe. And as long as we just teach them our language and give them a job, they will become like us. They will want to be liberal. They will want LGBT. They will want democracy, right? And they want rule of law. When in reality, they will want none of these things because their loyalty isn't here. They learn to speak the language, perhaps, right? And they pay taxes, perhaps, because you make them, right? But they're not here to care about your culture at all. They do not think that Western civilization is better or superior. In fact, they very likely hate it. There was this uh, American longshoreman philosopher, Eric Hoffer, who also mentioned this, is that the people who complain the most about inequality don't want to make things equal. They want to reverse the inequality, basically destroy the people they hate. Uh, many newcomers 
to a more advanced civilization will always carry this innate hatred for uh, for for the native population for for the others basically because psychologically someone from india can go to america but they remain psychologically indian people right they don't become part of the the wasp people the white anglo-saxon protestants who are the dominant founding group of the united states for example you can open the borders because you need cheap labor but as long as you need them for just for that for cheap labor they're not going to become the new cultural elite and if they do become some kind of a cultural elite it will be a different culture get it and so you uh, i heard uh, a u.s senator say that he need, he wanted illegals yes illegal immigrants should be allowed to join the u.s army i think this has been going on for much longer anyway where they said to a mexican man like hey if you join the army we'll give you citizenship right so it's army service in exchange for citizenship this is all completely insane because you bec you're becoming the Roman Empire. Uh, at the height of the Roman Empire, just before the fall, half of Rome's uh, legions were, were, uh, were uh, what do you call it, mercenaries. And, and same thing uh, going on today in the USA. Uh, the US Army has taken on so many mercenaries who eventually will use the, the lessons they learned against you. Imagine uh, a couple of million Mexican men returning from war fighting for the u.s empire right they come back to the usa what are they going to do they're going to take over they're going to fight the the white people why wouldn't they in the southern states of the u.s uh, only about 40 percent of new children born are white people and certain states are turning entirely mexican or latino or hispanic uh, you can think of that what you want but if there are any white people left in the usa who think that things will be fine they're very naive you know yeah it's like the foreign legion except it's the u.s army <laughs> the the french uh, legion étrangère foreign legion yeah that's a special division but they also have a real french army which by the way is also highly diverse nowadays right so all these weird things are going on in the western world where they are making um uh, you know western armies are becoming are taken on no white russians white russian men are obviously not allowed to join our armies but african men are and indian men are and, and you know arabs are muslims are and that's really strange because those people too just like the russians they their loyalty does not lie with us they couldn't care less about democracy they care about sharia law and then soon you will have sharia law professed in the in the u.s army right you know where uh, Sharia becomes the norm, and uh, and the Christian whites will have to fit in, right? and that's just so so ludicrous, really. Like, what are we doing here? Well, we don't have to do this. I mean, I keep talking about it from this perspective, but maybe we need to put some more push, put some more energy into it, right? We don't have to do this at all. That means, what are we going to do next? How are we going to revolt? How are, we, how are we going to stand up against these globalist elites who apparently only care about their economic interests and care not at all about the survival of their people? They look down on us so much, they don't even think of us as the dust underneath their feet, man. They, they think, of us, think of us as less than nothing. It's almost as if these, these ruling politicians and so on, as if they think they're the parents and the civilians are just children when it's really the other way around. They are the children and the civilians are the adults. You know, diversity never works in armies. Look at Hungary in World War I. I didn't know about that, but yeah, I suppose it never works. It didn't work for the Roman Empire very well. The Germanic tribesmen who uh, joined the Roman legions at some point conspired to fight Rome, and they successfully beat the Roman Empire at the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. So yeah, so it doesn't work. Hello from Ireland, yeah. So the whole Hellenic Republic might start wearing hats because of me, okay. The real question is, you got four or more kids, what are you doing to save your race? Talk is cheap. Yeah, talk is cheap. That's right. But that's what we have to do down there. You know, the whole notion of we need more children, by the way, is also a bit of a, a false argument. Uh, like a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, Europeans were fine and we had only a fraction of the number of people we have today. 
I would argue that having too many people and having to force them to live in cities and then having to organize an industry and having to have massive armies to conquer the energy needs, right, to take to take make sure that you have the energy to feed everybody, maybe that's the mistake, right? Now, an even bigger mistake would, of course, be to open borders for mass immigration, pouring them in. But the notion that you think you can fight a billion ch new children in Africa by having a billion white children more in Europe is, of course, false. Because it, it means all those children will be of a lower quality. You know, if you go for quantity over quality, you will automatically lose. This is why in the West, actually, we need to focus on quality. We don't need four kids per woman or nine kids per woman. We need two high IQ kids per woman or one genius kid per woman. And that's what that's how we would win. We need more intelligent offspring, not more just more, but stupid. That's useless. You know, for the next foreseeable time, if you if you really need stupid, dumb labor, we will have robots like they're doing like they do in Japan. Our focus should be on having a high quality offspring, strong children, right? Strong and high IQ, driven, visionaries, leaders, right? The ones you won't get. Look at what happened to Ukraine. The Ukrainian men that they sent to war against Russia, they weren't very smart and they weren't actually able to control the tanks, for example, or the weapon systems. They weren't able to do it. The reason they lost against Russia is simply because they weren't smart enough to learn how to use their weapons. These fancy, you know, high IQ weapons from the USA and from Germany, they didn't know how to use them, right? And that's the problem. If you have too many children that are no good, you also automatically die. You know, I mean, do you really think that if you have, we have like 1.3 billion Africans, but the average IQ is below 80, you know, and you're going to have two or three billion Africans by, by the end of the century, but the average IQ will still be below 80. You think they're going to build a mass, uh, an advanced civilization? No, they will forever be dependent on what smarter people are building for them, who are teaching them and educating them, right? And I'm not saying that the leaders in the West are smart because they're clearly not. All right, and that's the real problem here. Right, right here, someone says Europe isn't supposed to have a billion people. And no, no, we almost have a billion. We have like 700 million or so. In the EU, it's about 540 or so, if I'm right. But even that's way too many. We could go back to 100 million people, but then all we need to do is, can we organize, can we organize our defenses with fewer people? If we can success, if we can successfully defend Europe with 100 million people, or 200 million people, that would be preferable to what we have now. You know, instead of having all these old boomers in need of migrants coming to wipe their ass, why don't we send the boomers to Africa, all right? So the Africans, if there's Africans who want to take care of our, our old people, fine, you know? But why don't we send our old people to Africa, cleanse Europe a little bit, right? Get rid of our leadership. And we start with a whole new foundation where we focus more on turning Europe into a Spartan warrior state but still quality over quantity, you know? I don't think Europeans can make this mistake, you know? Asia, of course, traditionally had has most children, uh, including India, East Asia, Southeast Asia has about five, five billion people living there. And of course, uh, the quality of those people is very low. They're physically much smaller, right? Oh, they have higher IQs on average. Well, well, we'll see about that. The Indians certainly don't. And many uh, Chinese people, you know, never take IQ tests. So who are the, who are who are taking the IQ tests? Well, the smart ones are taking the IQ tests, so they have a very high average IQ. So don't be confused about things like that. You know, if you would take IQ tests in the in the Chinese countryside, it would be very very different. It's not what you'd expect. Same in Israel, you have like the Mizrahi Jews or something. They have an average IQ below 80. You know, there's there's millions of those living in uh, in Israel. Only the Ashkenazi are very smart because the Ashkenazi are more like Northern Europeans anyway, like Belarusians, right? Here. Yeah, the flag isn't for sale yet, but I do have a, a Teespring store somewhere. You might have a look there. Uh, let me see if I can give you the link for it. No. I always have a, a year ago. You can buy some uh, merchandise with the uh, with the flag here, you know.
but Europe won't die. Europeans will live on. We will have, say, 50 million, 100 million, 200 million people, and we will move on. We will have other things to do. The whole notion that populations always have to keep growing, economies always have to keep growing, this whole growth-based system turns into a war where all people are competing with each other for growth. That's why we're overeating the earth, right? We're, we're usurping the energy, right? Which is delusional. Uh, there are other ways to do this, namely by doing the exact opposite, by reducing our numbers deliberately, focus on quality over quantity, make ourselves strong, right? You know, there's nothing egotistical about it because the alternative is we'll be wiped out because other people are having more children anyway. We can't compete with quantity. We have never been able to, to compete with quantity. Keep that in mind, Europeans have never been able to compete with the rest of the world's quantity of humans. We always had to compete on quality and that is who we are. That is how we became. So we'll continue doing that really. Because, well, you know, yeah, I'm cooking. You know. I'm just thinking about, you know, how the game will play out. You know, the game is that the majority of non-Europeans, of non-Westerners are playing the game of uh, maximizing their population sizes and then sending their surpluses to the West as immigrants. So far, that's what's been going on. You know, even at the heyday of the colonial age, there were very few white people living all living in other people's countries, you know. Um, in Hong Kong, for example, you only had like, at the height of it, was just 8 or 10% white people living there. Uh, in India, you only, you only you had like 20,000 British white people who ruled the entire Indian subcontinent. You know, we didn't need a lot of people to do these things. Apartheid South Africa, you had a couple of million white people ruling tens of millions of blacks. You know, we, we never focused on, on, on quantity. We have to get smart. We have to see the future, right? To foresee things, how, where things are going, and then make the right decisions, including some very, very tough decisions. I was speaking about this earlier today, uh, about allowing hell to freeze over Europe. The question is, can you win by de-industrializing? De if we break down our industry on purpose and we de-urbanize Europe so that the big cities will disappear and people will be able to live on the land again as peasants, basically. But might we in the long run then be able to reinvigorate ourselves, to rebuild ourselves with new spiritual energies, new creative urges so that we can, you know, come out of it stronger than before whereas if we continue on this same track as we do now with the mass immigration and the, oh we got to be tolerant to everybody everybody's equal oh we was the colonizers we have to give everybody everybody our money blah 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 right you know this is all very peculiar we don't have to do this right uh, we can transform ourselves we can transform Europe into something really strong Someone says, but we never had this quantity of foreign humans in our own borders either. Well, we have dealt with, uh, you know, the Moors. We've dealt with the Arabs who came into uh, southern Italy. We dealt with the Mongol hordes, the Huns and so on. We've dealt with some. Oh, we've dealt with the Ottoman Empire. We have dealt with people coming into Europe and traditionally, or at least historically, we've, al we've always gotten rid of them in the end, you know. El Cid in Spain, for example, or Charles Martel in France at Poitiers fighting the fighting the Muslims. You know, and then there's John Sobieski fighting the fighting the Ottomans. You should look up Europe's history. How often we have beaten our enemies who tried to take Europe at Vienna twice, the siege of Vienna, at the Battle of Vienna, right? How often have we not successfully driven out the enemies again? It won't be different this time. It simply won't be different anymore. Someone asks, is the Netherlands a corporation? I'd say so, yeah, it's a corporation run by a shareholder, yeah. But also the Netherlands itself is also an investor in, in the American, in the US economy, meaning our rich families have heavily invested in the USA. And one day, uh, you know, this is why they cannot side with Russia. They cannot, their financial interests lie in the hands of Americans, so they have no choice but to keep supporting US interest. It's all economic self-interest, really. It's a bit sad, you know. 
The citizen farmer of Europe shall manifest itself again from the ashes of the old world. Well said. But that won't happen through a revolution because we live under an authority. Well, of course there will be the only way to overthrow this autocratic dictatorship, this communistic dictatorship that we're living in, is through some kind of a revolt, a revolution, yeah. But the idea is to wait for the right moment. If you realize, for example, how dependent Europe now is on, on foreign gas supplies and foreign oil supplies, only very little has to go wrong for things to blow up. If Qatar, for example, decides it doesn't want to supply its contractual uh, LNG, liquid natural gas, to Europe, Europe is dead. So if, uh, if the USA cannot supply it at some point, Europe will, your German industry will collapse. And that means there are, you know, Putin is smart. Putin knows if he could bomb the European LNG harbors where we take in the liquid nat natural gas, uh, Europe will be dead. You know, Europe is in a very weak position today. We are very, we are dependent on either the USA or on Qatar, the Muslim world, and so on to, to supply us with energy mostly. Uh, and the question is, is this what you want for Europe? Do you want Europe to be a sort of industrial powerhouse, but for with foreign shareholders? And you have to accept foreign immigrants and foreign workers. Why can't we Europeans have a place for our own? The only way to do it perhaps would be to let hell freeze over Europe and to accept that we are going to deindustrialize and deurbanize for some time in order to reemerge stronger later. You know? Why is the Federal Reserve Bank still private? I think people in London own the Federal Reserve so that the US economy is basically owned by uh, certain British groups. That's my idea at least. This is how they control the U.S. in the end, you know, right? Because, uh, you know, I mean, the leaders of Europe don't live in Europe, but the leaders of the USA also don't live in the U.S. The real leadership is probably somewhere in Tel Aviv or in Israel, right? Or, or perhaps it's London, but, you know, you know, do you, the USA used to be this massive colony of, of Great Britain, uh, of the British, but of course, after the American Revolution, they came in with the Federal Reserve Bank and they basically made sure that the US economy would still serve the interests of the British Empire. And yeah, at least that's my view. You know? What's Norway's position on all of this? Yeah, they have the energy and the gas. And so I think Norway worked together with the Americans to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline because they were going to make a ton of money off of this. But Norway, of course, is a very small country, 5 million people, 7 million people. They are you know, a vassal to the USA or a colony of the US, just like Germany, just like, just like all of Western Europe, really. So the Norwegian elites, they don't make any decisions. They, they, they do what, what the US tells them to do or what, what Tel Aviv tells them to do, you know? Yeah, they help, yeah, they sabotage Nord Stream, yeah. If Norway builds fracking sites in Europe, uh, they could be an LNG exporting nation, yeah. Yeah, we are going to have to have a talk about it. But again, what's the, what's the point here? Do you want Europe to stay a highly industrialized zone that needs the energy from all over the world and therefore must also tolerate mass immigration from all over the world and become this really silly thing where we are working our asses off merely for working our asses off? What? Why are we doing this? You know, why are we doing this? It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to live in this urban dystopia. It can also be reversed and it can be reversed quite easily, actually, if you have the guts to do it, if you have like, you know, the power to do it, you know. Yeah, just look at somebody like uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO leader. He's just a puppet, exactly. This was quite a shock to me, you know, several, uh, some while ago I realized these things, yeah, and then I thought, wow, you know, these people you look up to, these older people in their 50s who have careers uh, they've been they've they've been doing top careers for like 40 years of their lives and they are puppets they are not at all competent they don't do their own thinking they have no vision for europe other than the one that their speech writers you know write for them they're ghost writers you know it's just insane you know will mark rutte be the new nato puppet yeah possibly 
either he goes to NATO or to Brussels or something like that. I think he's waiting for a negotiation. He's waiting for w which way it will go. I don't think he even has the power to decide what he's going to be. They're going to use him and make him the NATO leader because he's, you know, he's weird. Right? Or they're going to make him um, some pre some kind of president in Brussels or something like the top leader of Brussels or they're going to maybe replace uh, von der Leyen with Rata or whatever they're going to do. They're going to do something with them because he's such a loyal puppet. He has proven his loyalty, you know. Yeah, the symbol behind me is Odin's raven flying up into the wind toward victory. It's basically a Danish, uh, a Danish Viking flag, but the flames are mine. I designed the flames. Every country in the world has a regulation for AI, except for India. So far, AI isn't even intelligent. It's just if then else, if this, then that. It is very unintelligent, very, very useless, really. We have a major puppet in Poland. He's called Donald Tusks. Yeah, exactly. I've heard so many crazy ideas. Either they want to uh, fuse Ukraine's Western territories with Poland or now even want to fuse Poland with Germany to combine these economies because the United States orders this. They want a strong European military that is able to fight Russia in the long term to protect their Western European vassal states, really, meaning their their market. The U.S. sells so much to Western Europe, Starbucks, McDonald's, Nike, you know everything they sell so much to us they are this all this whole fight is about who gets to win the european market the russians would like to have it as well get it so the russian industry would love to start selling its products to western europe in place of starbucks and in place of mcdonald's and so on right they would become so par powerful you know yeah afrocentric say that vikings were black <laughs> don't even pay attention to them um, it's clear that they are mentally mentally disturbed people who believe these things or now they say that isaac newton was a was a negro from nigeria or something come on you know we don't have to listen to these people klaus schwab was educated by henry kissinger so it's all a, a friends a friends group a, fr a friends circle you know henry kissinger appointed klaus schwab so and Henry Kissinger's big idea was that of the uh, the trilateral committee. He wanted he actually wanted to fuse Russia with Europe and North America to create a northern front, a northern hemisphere, which is not that not that bad of an idea compared to what we're doing now. Now all of a sudden we try to fuse Europe with Africa and with the Muslim world, and then we're supposed to fight Russia. Imagine if we would fuse with Russia and we could fight the Africans and the Arabs. To me, that would make more sense uh, spiritually, culturally, right? Uh, why are why are we fighting alongside Muslims and black people against white Christians when we should be fighting alongside the white Christians against the Muslims and the blacks? I just don't get it. I went once in my life. I went to this right wing club in the Netherlands. I had dinner with them. They were very friendly people, but they were all obviously pro american and I think they were more like more communist than anything else. They definitely weren't nationalist or so. What I thought was so strange about them is they all supported the LGBT coming out of the USA. So so that's when I said thank you for dinner and uh, goodbye. You know? It's very strange that they, they see Russia as the enemy primarily because Russia wants to crack down on the pedophiles and the homos. That's the real reason I think why so many, so many of these top people like Mark Rutte in the West they 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 hate russia because they think they're going to lose their freedom to rape kids that's what it's all about really all right if there's some people watching this um uh, you can follow me on my Substack, stack uh, www.jmk.info subscribe to my newsletter i'll send one out i'll send one out uh, once every week or so and I suppose you can also go to my Telegram backup. This is the back at Johannes MK for my Telegram. It's the backup for my uh, for my uh, for my TikTok videos. And because my videos get taken down quite regularly, uh, I always struggle with the appeals. But recently, I won like ten appeals in a row, or twelve or so, twelve appeals in a row on TikTok. It's like wow, I'm feeling good, right? I'm feeling god, I'm feeling godly. <laughs> but of course. 
uh, I always have to watch out. Uh, the bigger my account gets, the more wrong people I attract who report me and ban me. So I have to always really watch out how I phrase things. And sometimes I take down a video because I think it might get taken down. So I preempt it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You can also go to my YouTube. Is also at the Great Johannes. That's where I will post my longer videos. Uh, my videos about like this the stream, for example, I'll uh, post it there, and uh, my podcast videos go up there. You know. Do you think Schwab is Jewish? Possibly, yeah. Just like Henry Kissinger, right? Yeah, I'm beating all the bands so far. So far, I'm not. I haven't lost the account yet. I want to grow the account bigger and have more influence in the world. I want to start speaking at all sorts of events, but it's hard to find even events that I would, you know, trust. There are so many clubs and groups out there, but most most of them are either controlled opposition, meaning they support Israel, and they just want to uh... look. The whole thing with the Jews is they have two main fractions, two uh, two main factions. They have the Zionists and the, the communist globalists. But all of them want to have one world, right? It's just that the communistic Jews want to have a communist world government ruled democratically, quote unquote, whereas the Zionists want to rule the world themselves through their proxies, such as the USA or Russia or China, or whatever, right? So that's the real big deal uh, with them, the Zionists and the communists, or the Bolshevik and the Zionists. Uh, there was a letter that Winston Churchill, the young Churchill, wrote about precisely this topic. And I, I remember once reading this letter because it was online. It was available online where Churchill spoke of the Jews and this and that. But it's been completely scrubbed off of the Internet. When, when you Google that title, the title of that letter, you, you'll find mentions of it, but not the actual letter. It's been completely scrubbed, in my view. Yeah, I start my own event here. Yeah. Twitter is all right under Elon Musk. Twitter has a lot more freedom of speech than uh, than what, what it used to be. The flag in the back is my logo for my podcast. It's the Odin's Raven flying up in the wind toward victory. And the flames are my design. Yeah. Oh yeah, someone says there's actually three types. Okay, maybe there's one more than that. Yeah? Someone asks, why would you fight blacks and Arabs? Is that a question, really? No, we're not We're not really fighting the Middle East uh, because we're not fighting Qatar, we're not fighting Dubai, we're not fighting Saudi Arabia. We're only fighting the enemies of the Arabs. The Wahhabis, the Wahhabi Arabs, they hate Iran and they hate these others. So we're fighting, like the US Army is fighting to help spread the Wahhabism at the expense of the other... Uh, of the other uh, denominations. So it's not like we're fighting Arabs because they're Arabs, that's not happening. We're actually helping Saudi Arabia become more powerful. And we're fighting for uh, for Israeli interests and so on. But this isn't something I agree with. You know, This isn't something Europeans agree with. What we want to fight, of course, are the Arabs and the Africans coming to Europe as immigrants who come to live with us. There's gonna be, you know, and like I said, the most effective war in that sense would be to allow Europe to allow hell to freeze over Europe, you know. I mean, black men, according to the statistics of the US FBI, are up to 12 times as likely to commit murder than white men are. Even black women are more likely to commit murder than white men are. But of course, people nowadays don't even understand what per capita means, right? Someone says they noticed that most of my best videos are gone. Yeah, I have noticed uh, when my videos go viral, they usually get reported. I, most of my videos don't go over 50,000 views because by that time they've been reported and taken down already. And although I do win the appeal most of the time, nowadays 9 out of 10 times I win the appeals, I cannot reinstate these videos because then they might be reported again and they will be taken down again. So the only thing I can do is make more videos. Yeah, Klaus Schwab has, uh, definitely, yeah. Churchill double-faced alcoholic sold Poland to the Soviets. Yeah, never trust the English. Yeah. 
Yeah, they divided Europe into Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe went to Russia, Western Europe went to the, to the British, to the American Empire, the US Empire, really. And ever since, Europe has been a vassal to either. Either, you know, with the European Union, it changed a little bit because the Soviet Union collapsed. And in the wake of it, we captured Eastern Europe. We meaning the US Empire captured Eastern Europe as well. So they start selling them uh, McDonald's and, and Starbucks, right? Mosley should have led the USA, the UK instead of Churchill, perhaps, you know. Look at Syria, 12 million displaced because of the wars with proxies, you know. Uh, uh, to a large degree, this is also simply Muslim colonialism at work. They're just colonizing Europe by sending as many people as they can to Europe. So they will use any excuse to send more people to Europe. So they can Islamize Europe and then take over Europe, really. Because in Islamic Europe, what do you think an Islamic Europe will do? They will destroy Israel. They will completely destroy Israel. So that's why they want Europe. Was BLM a color revolution? I have no idea, man. You mean like a fake revolution? Yeah. Yeah, possibly in that sense. Yeah. Just like the Arab Spring. Yeah, S I suppose so. But why? Why? Why does the US leadership hate white men so much? All right. Because they simply need very quickly, because of the timing issue, very quickly they need to get the black people on board and the Muslim people on board and the Indian people on board so they can fight Russia and China and that's what it's all about. Because they realize simply there's not enough white men to fight Russia, not enough white men willing to fight Russia. But, you know, the poor men coming out of Africa, they will fight for anything as long as you're paying them, see? They're mercenaries. Why can't we say the H word? I don't know what that is. You know. How many countries have you gone to war with in the Middle East for no reason? None. I've never gone to war with any country. You know, the Zionist interests are not Europe's interests. So you cannot blame us for things that the American Jews are doing. This isn't us. This is not Europeans doing anything. So. I believe because it's biblical, Zionists see white Europeans as Amalek, which need to be destroyed. Okay. I don't know anything about that. That's too far fetched for me. Yeah, the Maidan revolution was also a coup by the USA. Obama actually did the coup in Ukraine, and that's why we now have this war with Russia, because they breached all sorts of uh, treaties, peace treaties that they had in place, you know. Yeah. Is there a lot of diverse ads in the Netherlands as well? Yeah. Yeah, every commercial has a black man and a white woman. And the only time you'll see a white man is if he's retarded or something. Yeah, every couple is, uh, is mixed race. Uh, but it's worse than that. In the Netherlands, you have a lot of commercials where you have like two gay men adopting a child or like an African child. Two white men with an African child. Buying children that way should be totally forbidden. It's just so, so weird, man, you know. The, US, the United States is the primary interventionist power. We just stick Europe with the bill. Yeah. Yeah, Europe pays for it, yeah. Through our economy. I think most whites agree and know what is best, but we are too fearful of admitting it. Yeah, perhaps that is so, yeah. All right, I'm going to log off again. Uh, probably, probably we'll be back tomorrow again with another hour or so at most of talking. So have a nice evening.